Hello, everyone. I am Ben Johnson, and this is the Perpetual Chess Podcast. Perpetual Chess is a weekly chess interview show with accomplished chess players, authors, personalities, and adult improvers where they discuss their lives, their careers, and share tips about how to improve at chess. For more information, go to perpetualchesspod.com. So without further ado, let's get to the... Hello, everyone, and welcome to an Adult Improver special edition of Perpetual Chess. Some of you may have heard me tease this episode in my own recent interview at the end of 2021. In 2022, we're going to expand our series of interviews about ascending through a specific rating level. So this upcoming current episode continues the series started with episode 217, which was called I Am to GM. And as you saw in the title, this one is called Master to I Am. It interviews three people working towards the international master title. Like the grandmaster title, the I Am title is a title bestowed by FIDE. It requires three, quote, norms, which basically means a tournament meaning certain parameters where the player attains a performance rating of 2450 FIDE. And the IM title also requires that you attain a FIDE peak rating of 2400. As I discuss with these guests, though, hopefully for all of you, chess improvement is not just about changing the number or letters next to your name, because of course, there are more important things than that. So I think that these guests would all say, and I certainly feel this way about my own chess work, that even if you don't end up improving, hopefully the work you do uh, teaches you something about yourself generally and uh, gives you a worthwhile feeling. Um, So we have three interviews with master level guests coming your way. They're all at similar chess strengths, but different life stations, 28-year-old FM and coach Dalton Perrine, 38-year-old lawyer, coach, and dad, Evan Rosenberg, and 57-year-old retired CPA, FM Doug Eckert. I also wanted to make a few small programming announcements. Number one, as you'll hear in the interview with Evan Rosenberg, in 2022, Perpetual Chess is proud to be partnering with Chess.com on Adult Improver episodes for a sponsored segment called the Chess.Bomb. So shout out to Chess.com as well as our other frequent sponsors, Chessable, Aim Chess, Chess Fizz, and Chess Mood. We're really spoiled with all of the chess learning tools available these days. I also wanted to let you all know that I finally made a dedicated landing page for the Adult Improver interviews on the Perpetual Chess website. It links to all of the Adult Improver interviews, including a Spotify playlist of them, and shares a few of my own chess improvement uh, guidelines as well. So that's about enough preamble. Uh, I want to get you to the interviews. As always, the timestamps are in the show notes, but um, in terms of sequencing these interviews, they are played in the order they were recorded. I spoke with FM Doug Ecker in mid-December, Evan Rosenberg earlier this week, and uh, here in early January, and Dalton Perrine uh, just earlier today here on Thursday, January 6th. Um, so in my extremely unbiased opinion, these are all enjoyable and worthwhile interviews, but we will let you all judge for yourselves and we will get first to the Doug Eckert interview after the break. Listeners, I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is I'm still stuck at being behind on the clock in 77% of my blitz games, neither getting better nor worse, just spinning my wheels endlessly. The good news is, unlike me, Aim Chess has managed to improve its product even more. They've totally redesigned the interface of AimChess.com. They've added the ability to use Aim Chess even if you don't have a linked account on Chess.com, Lee Chess, or Chess24. They've expanded payment options to include Google Pay and Apple Pay. So doing everything they can to make Aim Chess even more user-friendly and fun, accessible, and educational. So if you haven't already, be sure to check out aimchess.com. And as always, use the code PERPETUAL30 to receive a 30% discount if you decide to subscribe. 
And we are here with FIDE master Doug Ecker. Doug is a retired tax professional. He specialized in international taxation and mergers and acquisition. He is 57 years of age, married with three kids in their 20s. He's a member of the St. Louis Chess Club Board of Directors. Uh, on the chess front, he started when he was 15. He was recently featured, or well, in March, he was featured in My Best Move in Chess Life magazine. Um, Doug quickly became pretty strong. He won the U.S. Junior Open in 1983 and 1984. Of course, as an adult, like a lot of us, he has played off and on. But since he retired a few years ago, he has been quite on. He is a member of a uh, friend of the show, GM Jakob Agard's Killer Chess Academy, training regularly. And as we record, headed to Charlotte to play in one of their IM norm events the next day so we will be talking about all that stuff but first let's welcome fm doug eckert to the show hey doug how are you great thank you very much and appreciate you having me on yeah i'm excited i reached out to fm peter giannatos another friend of the show and said hey you know i'm looking to interview some people who will be um you know, who are playing regularly in norm events and in, in your general rating range. And Peter suggested you right away. And of course, I was already familiar with you being a chess life reader and of course, um, being friendly with the folks at uh, Killer Chess Training. Um, so, so Doug, I'd like to dive right into chess training. I know you've got some stories to tell about your life in chess and, you know, brushing brushing up with uh, many legends in St. Louis, but let's start with the chess training. So now that you're retired, how do you approach uh, chess, Doug? Well, I, I'd like to spend more time on it than what I do, but, you know, being a little bit older, I find that I'm probably limited to about 30 hours a week. You know, when I was <laughs> retired, I thought I could probably do 40 or 50, but the reality is it's probably, you know, four, four hours a day to five hours a day. And, you know, I try and split it up between some amount of problem solving, some amount of opening theory and, um, you know, a few blitz games here and there online, although I'm not addicted to it, but just, to, you know, play some moves. And, you know, I, I think Jakob, the thing that he's impressed on a lot of people is, is that opening theory leads to equality. What's important is how well you play the middle game and how well you calculate. So I've been spending more time on that. Than what I used to. And when I was growing up, if I had spent more time there, maybe the results would have been different. Yeah, well, I feel like your results were pretty good. I mean, as we alluded to, 15 these days, it's like you're a dinosaur when you start, unfortunately. Back back in uh, closer to when you and I were kids, um, 50, it wasn't unusual to start at 15, but it still seems like to, to be able to win the Junior Open and compete in Junior Championships um, shows a pretty quick ascension before college got in the way. <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, it was a great time, um, but chess players are stronger today. So, you know, back in the day there, if you sort of focused on a few things and got good at them, I think you could make master and play at a decent level. But today, with all the kids having professional trainers, the kids are probably 100 to 200 points stronger today than what they were, you know, 40 years ago when we're talking. It's hard to believe that it's almost 40 <laughs> years ago that we're, we're talking about this. But, you know, I, I was able to get into the U.S. Junior closed in 1984, and I finished fourth place as a qualifier, which was a good result. That was the year Patrick Wolf won. And I don't think he won the World Junior Championship that year, but I think he came pretty close. Yeah, I was researching. I was trying to track track down who you played against in that <clears throat> tournament. So it looks like Patrick was a few years younger. Is that right? He was. The only grandmaster we had in the tournament was Max DeLugge. And it's kind of a funny story because Max um, tied for fourth place with me. And after four rounds, he had a half point out of four. And then a few weeks after the tournament ended, he came in second place in the U.S. Men's Championship. And he qualified for the, the zonal tournament. And if he would have either drawn his last round, I think he lost, he would have qualified for the candidates tournament. And that all happened in a sequence of about four months. So Max went from not doing very well in the U.S. Junior Championship to almost being a candidate for the World Championship in, in a few months. Wow. Yeah. And of course, went on to achieve a lot in competitive chess and known as a blitz blitz specialist with a chess academy in, in New York these days but but let's bring it back to your chess improvement because it's funny when i hear to hear you say because of your age you can only do 30 hours a week because i think a lot of people listening feel like they would they would love to do 30 hours a week um so you had something to add 
Well, I was just going to say I'm retired, so I'm not working yeah, 40 hours a week. So, you know, I thought when I retired, I'd be able to substitute. And I was working more than 40 hours a week. I was probably working closer to 60, but I thought that I could substitute 40 hours of chess in pretty easily. It just hasn't worked out that way. Yeah. And Doug, I announced to Patreon subs of the podcast, I'll be interviewing you as well as uh, Evan Rosenberg um, and FM Dalton Perrine, three players around the same level. I think all of you would love to be IM someday if everything uh, broke right. And I, I was so I was curious um, and I got a question from supporter of the podcast, um, Mark Miller, who actually played you, he said, in the late 1980s. And you, he said you were kind enough to go over the game with him. He said he's a, a class player and, and greatly appreciated that. But what Mark wondered is something that comes up fairly often on the podcast. Uh, Grandmaster Avtek Gregorian has written and discussed, and so has his friend GM Noel Studer, the idea of starting with why. If you're going to spend a lot of energy trying to get better at chess, you need to answer the question why. And I think for, for us adult non-professionals, um, sometimes it's not so easy to put our finger on the reason. So Mark and I, for that matter, were wondering, what is it for you that motivates you to put so much time into chess when when you could just be sitting by the pool at the, at this point? Well, you know, getting back to those U.S. Junior Championships we talked about, I more or less stopped playing because I started my working career when my rating was still going up. So there was always the question in my mind, what was sort of my peak potential versus what I actually was. And now, of course, I'm I'm fighting the age decline related curve. So I, I'm really sort of trying to find out where the intersection of my potential was versus the age decline curve. And I, I'd love to say that I could become an international master, but when you look at where I'm at rating wise or I'm at age wise, I mean, the odds are just astronomically stacked against me. But at the same time, you know, I had a result this summer where I had a FIDE performance rating of 2,500 plus. Um, so that gave me some hope that it wasn't absolutely impossible. Yeah, it's, it's a very impressive result. Um, so Doug, does this great result make you, make you feel like earning the IM title might be possible after all? It might be possible, but again, you know, when you look at it from a rating perspective, I'm in the low 2200s from a FIDE perspective, which is actually good because I, I was, you know, down around 2100 for a couple of years. But in order to pick up 200 rating points, I mean, once the rating differential is 125 points, the higher rated player wins 66% of the time, which means they're twice as good. So in order for me to get from where I'm at to I am, I have to effectively have results that are twice as good as what I'm doing right now. And at my age, that's, you know, that's not going to be easy, but it's a goal. And I, I'm going to continue to play until the results decline because it's age related. And when they do, I'll find another aspect of chess to spend my time on. Yeah. And, and again, so far, the results are moving in the right direction. And I guess maybe you could call it a stretch goal. You know, it's good to have sort of a lofty goal. But then in the meantime, if you're showing good progress, uh, that's quite, quite admirable. Um, yeah, I was going to say it's a stretch goal, but it's really the only goal there is because I have an FM title. So it's the it's the next and only yeah. one there could be. Yeah. And I'm yeah. not doing I I'm obviously not doing it for the money or to make this a career. I'm doing it because I like the competition and I like the people and I like the process. Yeah, which is the, the important thing. if you were torturing yourself, uh, I would I would question <laughs> question spending all this time doing it. It's, and and so you mentioned Jakob has you doing a lot of calculation exercises. I think a lot of people working to improve, that's what they that's what they I was speaking from experience here. That can be the hardest thing to to devote oneself one to, do you find it challenging, like uh, from a motivation perspective, to really dig into the hard work when you're not playing, like in between tournaments? It's exceptionally challenging. I mean, Jakob would like us to solve, you know, six to eight, you know, puzzles a day out of his books, which are really hard. And to be honest, I find it difficult to do more than four or five of them. And if you're part of his homework club, I mean, he gives us 12 puzzles a week and his targeted score is six and he has grandmasters in that group. So it's very easy to end up with, you know, four and a half or five out of 12 and be very frustrated with it. And I, I've come to the conclusion looking at my own games, if I'm getting 10 or 20 percent better at tactics, my results go up tremendously because, you know, the accuracy of my games, I think, are pretty reasonable at, at this point. Um, and, and it really comes down to one or two moves in the games. And even my games against, you know, very strong IMs or GMs. 
you know, I'm generally playing a very hard fought game and it comes down to, I get to a critical moment. And if I find the move, I'm going to have a, a good result. I'm going to win. And if I don't find the move, I'm not. And all that homework is trying to figure out how do you recognize when you're at the critical moment and then spend your energy there and then hopefully calculate accurate enough to, to make the right moves. And you do feel like you're improving at those aspects, Doug? I, I'm improving, but it's still the weakest part of my game. I, yeah. I mean, you, you hate to admit it, but I mean, I'm I'm not good at prophylactic moves during the middle of combinations. Um, I'm not good at backward moves. Um, I'm sometimes not good at um, sitting there when, when you meet resistance. And I, I think for a lot of players at the master level, it's the meeting of resistance that is the toughest thing to overcome. Is that something that you've just noticed from your own analysis or is it from working with Jakob or other coaches that, that that's been highlighted? Um, it's been highlighted, but it's also just my, my own analysis. And, and if you look at this nice result I had in the senior championship, the question becomes, what does it really mean? Because if you look at the games, no one put up any resistance. I mean, the players were high rated, but when it came to the critical moments, they didn't find the best defenses. Yeah, I think a lot of that can come down to form, as you say. It's something that even if you're lower rated, you've been actively training. Whereas with the senior, I get the impression a lot of the uh, a lot of the players, although they may be legends, they're mostly semi-retired, and there's and it takes a while to to shake the rust off more than more than one tournament per year. Right. So when you're playing these young kids, that you know they're working on tactical trainers every day. They got coaches. Their minds are working faster. Um, that, that's formidable. And I think you know the other issue that I face is, you know, the the most common co time controls is game ninety plus thirty seconds, and I, I'm at a severe disadvantage when I get down to the thirty second increment because you know, as an older player, we're just slower, and yeah. there's nothing you can do about it. You just have to recognize that you try your best not to put yourself in that situation. But if you got a 60 move game against a GM, you're invariably playing on the increment. And, and the other thing that I was impressed with, you know, when I went to one of Jakob's in-person camps with some of the GMs, they're simply faster than us normal masters. And I don't think people recognize how fast they are. So, you know, he was giving us a six problem sheet to solve in, you know, an hour. And he was giving the grandmasters those six problems plus 12 more. And they're they're three times quicker. Yeah, yeah. I've I've told stories before, but I grew up with I am Greg Shahadi. We went to school together, and and you know I at my peak was also I was a like low like mid twenty two hundreds USCF, um, and I just couldn't believe how much faster Greg was. And then Greg is you know he's he's obviously he's a, he might be strong for an IM, but but he's nothing noteworthy in the in the sea of uh, IMs and GMs. So it's just amazing to 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 start to think about like someone with a 26, 2700 free day reading, how how quickly their uh, their um, synapses must fire. Um, but I mean, I commend you that you're working on it. And so what's your approach to to openings, Doug? Um, I try and find strategic openings. And when I say strategic, that doesn't mean they're not necessarily sharp tactically, but there's some strategic theme that I can potentially gain an advantage from. Um, and hopefully I understand it a little bit deeper. So when I'm playing these younger kids that I know are probably faster and sharper than me tactically, if I get a position that I understand better strategically, it gives me winning chances and it gives me the ability to gain an advantage against them that I'm, I'm not going to give up. That's yeah. So more of a uh, structure based approach than like a move memorization. Yeah, let's face it. There's a lot of move memorization, but it, it is a structure approach. But it's also just a position where understanding matters a lot. Yeah. You know, as opposed to a superficial, I can play here, here, and here, and I should be okay. Yeah. And without giving away too many secrets, is it, do you gravitate towards like a narrow opening repertoire or do you, are you, do you try to be unpredictable? I know it's especially important since you're playing closed events. Well, I, by definition, I'm narrow because I just can't remember anything anymore. I, it, you know, it's kind of funny. And I tell people this story uh, around, let's say, 1987 or so when I started my working career, I probably played 1200 USCF rated games. And I could reproduce every move of all 1,200 USCF rated games for you without looking at the score sheets. And now I, I can't remember any of them. So 
you know, and opening theory is the same way. I, I try and get to a position and say, okay, this is a critical position, and I, I know what move the critical move is, and I can sort of work my calculation into it, but I, I can't remember it. Yeah, yeah, it's it's definitely a challenge, and obviously, as you mentioned, you you feel like calculation is uh, one of the weaker parts of your game, relatively speaking. In terms of openings, like out of the thirty hours a week, how much time are you spending devoted to openings? Do you think? Um, probably twelve hours to fifteen hours of it, and the other, you know, twelve to fifteen is mostly calculation exercises. Okay. Yeah, and is it? Is it all from um, Killer Chess Training's puzzle set, or do you use other sources as well? Um, other sources as well. I mean, the, the puzzle set's probably, you know, half of it, and then another half from, you know, Jakob's other books or other books that have easier exercises. I've decided that I can't spend every hour on exercise or I'm beating my head against the wall. Yeah, it takes a special wiring. I, I have to admit, even now I'm I'm finally doing some tactical training, but I don't do the ones where, like uh, when I interviewed FM Peter Giannatos, he, he said sort of the sweet spot is if you're getting 60 to 70% right, in his opinion. And right now I'm doing ones where I get probably <laughs> higher than that, which is more gratifying, but maybe less, uh, <laughs> maybe less productive. I'm not sure. Um, yeah, but I think his answer, and I listened to that podcast, was you know sort of spot on. That if you're spending you know five to seven minutes, that's probably yeah. a, a nice amount of time. Whereas some of these exercises we're getting the killer chest training are, you know, they're 10, 15, 20 minute exercises. Yeah, usually if I think that long in a tournament game, it's already it's it's bad news. <laughs> right. But you know, but when you're playing these real top guys, um, and you get to these critical positions, you, you gotta say, okay, I'm gonna invest fifteen or twenty minutes here because you know what ends up happening is if you don't find the right move, all of a sudden your opportunity to have an easy finish passed, and now all of a sudden it gets harder. And, and, you know, if you look at a lot of the games I've lost against grandmasters over the years, it's like, okay, I had the opportunity and I missed it. And now all of a sudden it went from, I missed it to now it's harder and it's harder and it's harder. And, and, and that's generally, you know, the pattern where you see the GMs beating players of our strength where we're sort of mid-level masters that, you know, they, they put up resistance, we miss our chance and now all of a sudden it's harder and we give them a chance and they, they grab it. They don't yeah. miss it. Yeah. The, amen. <laughs> it's very true. Um, and we have a couple more listener questions. Uh, this one, Doug, is from uh, Alex Friedman, who asks, he says, uh, do you feel that it's easier to make progress in chess when you're a little younger, but busier with kids in work or a little older, but less busy? Um, it, it's easier for me right now. I mean, I had three kids. I also had a career where I was working 60 to 70 hours a week. So, you know, my chess was, I'd spend a half hour here and there. And, you know, occasionally I played in tournaments with no preparation and that that's not a, a recipe for success. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's good that you were able to reap, reap the benefits of working so hard and retire, retire young. Yeah. I mean, I, I was able to retire at age 54. And, um, you know, I think I mentioned to you, there was sort of an interrelation between my career and my chess playing in that, um, you know, tax mergers are really like a chess game. I mean, there's about five or six different pieces in a merger that all have specific rules in terms of how they work together. And, you know, as a chess player, I found it pretty easy to put those pieces together in a, a merger transaction. And a lot of people, they'd be sitting there going, Doug, how do you figure this out? But at the same time, you know, because the rules are finite, it's like somebody telling you the answer and contains the move bishop takes h7 check. And as a chess player, how often would you get the answer yeah. correct if you knew that? And the answer is you'll get it right 99.9% .9 of the time. Whereas, you know, I, I found that in the work world, very few people think like chess players do. Um, but chess has a lot of great skills to... Um, you know, life skills. And, you know, at the chess club, we're sort of focused on that. There's some studies that we're putting together to try and prove that there's an educational benefit to chess. You know, from a statistical perspective, it's maybe not so easy. Um, but the way I've looked at this, and hopefully I'm not segging into something you didn't want to talk about here. No, no, I, I find it I find it very interesting. And, and I agree. It, it comes up with reasonable frequency on the podcast that as you allude to, like we, we think it's, 
it's probably good for kids. I mean, certainly there's lots of anecdotal evidence, uh, such as yourself and John, friend of the pod, John Fernandez, and many others have told stories about the, the success that chess has helped them have in terms of critical thinking in, in the corporate world. But as you alluded to, the, where the rubber meets the, meets the road is it would be nice if we had like measurable data, but that's sort of the hardest thing to, to, to come across. And of course, there are some studies that, that support these uh, hypotheses. Right. And the chess club's working on that. I mean, you know, they, they're, you know, have chess in the schools in St. Louis and they've got data sets from the schools and, you know, and we're hoping that we can prove it out over the next year or two. COVID sort of slowed it down because there wasn't any in-person training. And so that slowed the data set issue down. But I, I've always sort of looked at chess, you know, you have the position, which is, uh, you know, the facts in a case. And then while you're thinking about a move, that's either strategic thinking or tactical thinking. And then the decision is actually making the move. And then, you know, after you make a move, you either make a mistake and you've got to try and figure out, can you save this? So that's sort of being objective about what you did. And then if you lose because of it, okay, let's be a good sport about it. You know, so, it, you know, when you look at successful people in life, you know, I think you have to be good at all four of those areas and the great failures in human history generally result because you're not good at either, you know, objectively looking at the facts, you know, doing good strategic planning or, you know, good tactical implementation, or you can't make a decision, just forces you to make a decision. Or if, you know, you screw up that you don't objectively deal with the aftermath. And that's everything that chess is about. Yeah, yeah, Th those, are, those are great insights. Um, so let's bring it back to to your competitive play a little bit. Um, again, as we record this, you're heading to Charlotte tomorrow. Um, so, <laughs> excuse me, one question I have, Doug, is how many tournaments are you playing per year? And then after that, I'd like to hear about how your prep changes as a tournament uh, approaches. Um, well, I wanted to play a bunch of tournaments this year. Unfortunately, after the senior event, I got sick. And right now I've got a bunch of events scheduled. So I'm playing here in Charlotte, then I'm going to Vegas a couple days after that. And then I'm playing in a New York IM event um, in the middle of January. Um, so my, my goal is to play really once every four to six weeks and to try and just play in, you know, master level events. So that, that's the goal. So maybe, you know, let's say 10 tournaments a year, but in the next few weeks, it'll, it'll be more than that. That's great. Yeah. I think that's, that's a good objective for, for lots of people. And obviously your kids being grown helps, but does, does your wife uh, mind that, that you're traveling so much for chess? Uh, I, I also want to travel with her as well. So, I mean, there, there's a balance there. Um, she has a lot of friends that she hangs out with, and I don't know that she cares one way or the other if I travel, <laughs> yeah. you know, but we, we do our other things together as well. So, and, and part of retiring was to spend more time with my family too. Yeah, of course. Um, and then as, as uh, the tournament approaches, Doug, again, like a time like this where, you know, you've been gearing up for this tournament, does, does your study approach change? Do you spend more time on openings? Um, and I might as well spring it on you now. Evan Rosenberg is a friend of the pod, and he submitted the question, what have you prepared against your first round opponent in the upcoming <laughs> yeah, Charlotte Norm tournament? For, well, sure. I, I mean, in a Norm tournament where you know who you're playing and what colors you have, the opening preparation becomes more specific to the opponent. But at the same time, you know, you have to be generally prepared because, you know, they're likely preparing for you as well and think that, aha, I know where Doug's weakness is or Doug's never tried this before. So I'm going to see what he knows about this. So, yeah, on a norm tournament, it's it's more player specific. Um, and in between, it's more repertoire. Where are the holes? What could I add to the repertoire type stuff? Yeah, that makes sense. And how often do you feel like you you get the position, the opening you expected in these norm tournaments. I imagine there would be a lot of zagging from from people. You know, it, it's about 50%, give or take. Okay. And, you know, I also, I do some opening preparation for some of the GMs around too. And I found, you know, when we're trying to guess what their opponents are going to play, it's about 50%, give or take. And to some degree, that's actually worse helping to prep for people because then you actually have to watch them play. And then if they forget the analysis, that's worse than sitting there yourself. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it can, it can be tricky. So so as a tournament comes up, do you spend more time on, again, in, this ca in these cases, it's unique because it's for a specific person. But would you ramp up either your, like, do you spend more time on a certain phase of the game? Or is it pretty constant where you're doing mostly calculation, but maybe one third openings, as you mentioned earlier? 
Um, during the tournament, I don't do any calculations. Sorry, I'm, I meant leading up, leading up to the tournament. Oh, leading up to the tournament, um, it's still the same level of preparation, maybe a few more hours a week, um, but it leans them a little bit more heavily towards the opening side, certainly. Okay. And then do you have any in-tournament tips you could share in terms of like energy management and, uh, you know, diet, stuff like that? Well, um, I had, like I said, I had some health issues, so I'm trying to stick to sort of a, a lower fat, you know, water-based diet as opposed to some of the stuff that I ate before. And, you know, getting eight hours of sleep, I tend to play better when I sleep better. Um, you know, but in tournaments, I, I'm also one of these people that if I make a bad mistake, I, I tend to beat myself up over it, which is probably a psychological impediment to improving or getting to the next level. And when I'm beating myself up, I'm probably not sleeping as well. So yeah, if you can forget your mistakes and sleep well, and it's really too late to do in-depth opening preparation at a tournament because there's simply not enough time. So I, I tend to spend, you know, 30 minutes looking at um, things that I expect might happen and just review a couple highlights and then try not to worry about it too much. Just be relaxed, come to the board, and, and be ready to fight. I, I don't look at any of my opponents as I, I should win this game. I look at every opponent as this is going to be a tough fight, and i got to be prepared to sit there as long as it takes. Yeah. And then, so I'm guessing with these invitationals, sometimes it's one game in a day and sometimes it's two. Is that right? It's mostly two games a day. The first round is one game a day, and you know, and, and that's the hard part, I think, about these norm turns, especially as you get older. I mean, when you're sitting there, you're looking at probably at least eight hours at the board during the tournament a day. And, and then if you're spending another, let's say, hour and a half of preparation time, you, you've got at least a 10 or 11 hour day. Yeah, that's rough. Yeah. And and I'm 44. And yeah, the the difference between how fresh you can feel for one game as opposed to two, even at my age, is, is stark. Right. So. Yeah. And I'd uh, like to play in Europe where there's more, you know, one day tournaments and, and maybe we'll do that. I mean, unfortunately, in the last year and a half, we've had the, the travel issues. So, right. Well, they they just announced the Reykjavik Open, Doug. Might, might want to make that happen. <laughs> no, the March or April, I can't remember which. But, um, well, Doug, this has been amazing. I last thing before we let you go. Certainly, we wish you luck in Charlotte. Is I wanted to hear any standout chess stories. I mean, again, I know you. I know you've played Kasparov and Asimov, and 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 living in and being on the board in St. Louis. I'm sure you get to meet some of the uh, the the giants of the chess world. Sure. I, I mean, you know, I, I've obviously been to the, the U.S. championships. In fact, I was fortunate enough to play in the first U.S. championship in 09 when one of the players got sick. And, you know, the Kasparov game was a, a fascinating game where I, I had my chances and then blundered and lost. And, you know, in St. Louis, I, I've met I've met all the top 10 players in the world that have been through there. We've got several that live here in St. Louis. Um, I've played blitz chess against quite a few of them. I, I, I lose the very vast majority of those games, but I, I have occasionally won some games against some, shall we say, rather big named opponents. But, you know, they're, they're ridiculously better than I am. Um, and, and most of these guys, they're, they're super nice guys. Um but the amount of preparation they have, um, the amount of knowledge they have, I, I think most people have a hard time fathoming just how good these guys are. Yeah, yeah, it's it's really, it's really really incredible. Um, okay, and and very last thing, Doug, for anyone uh, around around your age or older who's listening, what what general chess longevity advice could you share? Well, I think the first thing is you need to be realistic where you're at. And so, you know, if you played chess 20 years ago and you were an 1800 player, like I said, I think the kids are stronger today. So you should expect that you're probably realistically, you know, 16, 1700. And then, like I said, you know, every 125 rating points or so, you're, you're twice as good. So you should A, set what's a realistic goal. Um, and, and then how much time do you want to spend at it? And there's a lot of things that make chess a great um, hobby. I mean, competition is one thing, but there's problem solving, there's coaching, there's just hanging out and playing rapid events and not worrying about it. So you should find what you enjoy and, and just do that. And if your goal is to get better, then, okay, you should be realistic about what the time commitment is and what the you know possibilities are. Fantastic advice. I love it, Doug. And, and it's very inspiring to, to hear, I mean, first of all, the success you've had, but also just... Um, 
the the dedication, the amount of time you're putting in. So I will certainly be rooting for you um, in Charlotte and beyond, and uh, hope hope to see you in person at one of these tournaments one of these days. Okay, great. Appreciate the time, and it was an honor being on your show. You've had some fantastic guests over the years, and uh, just a fantastic show. Thank you, Doug, and uh, safe travels and good luck. Great. Thank you. The latest from Chessable includes Keep It Simple Black by I am Christoph Selecki. That offers a repertoire against E4 and D4, the Carol Khan, the Queen's Gambit decline, plus those pesky sidelines you might face. There's also new offerings from Friends of the Pod, Han Shoot with a line against the Shveshnikov, FM Camille Plikta with a lifetime repertoire's accelerated dragon course. And of course, there's tons of tactics offering as well, if that's your preferred training method. And whatever it is you study on Chessable, you will be able to utilize their space repetition technology to help you remember open opening lines and tactical patterns. And always remember, they have lots of free content as well. So just be sure to go to chessable.com and check out their latest offerings. And we are here with another master interview, a gentleman chasing the IM title in theory, or at minimum, attempting to get better at chess and working hard on his game. He is a 38-year-old education attorney, a chess instructor, a dad. He is a USCF master. His rating peaked at 2336 USCF in 2011. It's been bouncing all over the place in subsequent years dipped to about 2,200, is starting to climb again. Uh, our guest is an active member of the Chess Dojo. He's been taking lessons with Grandmaster Eugene Perlstein. Uh, I'm old friends with him from our New York slash East Coast chess circles, uh, and I'm excited to welcome him to the show, Evan Rosenberg. Evan, what's going on? Thank you, Ben. I am equally excited to to be on the show. Yeah, I'm excited, and we should say you just, you know, as I mentioned, uh, Active member of the Chess Dojo, our friends at the Chess Dojo, and you recently did a long form interview with them called Meet the Dojo that listeners can also check out. So we'll try not to um, we'll try not to rehash too much stuff from there. But I did really enjoy that interview. And I wanted to start with a, a topic you did touch on in that. But I think it's important to sort of set the stage for all of the I am title chasers or improvers that I'm interviewing in in this uh, special episode, and that is, what is your why? So Mark Miller, uh, Patreon sub, had written in to ask, uh, generally, I think it's a good question to ask each of you. Um, you know, Evan, I think you in particular are probably the busiest of the three people I'm um, interviewing. No disrespect to uh, FM Dalton Perrine and uh, Doug Ecker, but when you've got young kids, it's a whole different ball game. So what makes you still motivated to uh, to Chase chess improvement at this stage of your life, Evan. Wow, uh, that is uh, that is the the sort of driving question. Um, so, my my biggest mistake was probably earning uh, an I am norm in the first place, <laughs> right? Uh, and and that happened uh, over over a decade ago, um, when I was not uh, actively in pursuit of any sort of uh, advanced title. Uh, I was just uh, really enjoying uh, life. And, uh, you know, similarly, I was playing really excellent quality chess and uh, earning that first I am norm. Um, it, it gave me the belief that I could actually uh, achieve the title. And, um, Although a lot has has transpired since, um, uh, I'm I'm still anchored to that belief that um, if I continue to try, that I that I could do it. Um, and, and why is that important to you? So I have uh, invested a lot of my time uh, into learning about and and teaching. Um, but also uh, my own personal improvement at, at chess. Um, chess is a, uh, a, a, a really significant part of my life. And um, these, these titles, is, from my perspective, uh, are, are essentially benchmarks, right? And they, uh, they act as um, a sort of, 
barrier to entry in a way as, as, as far as commanding respect, um, for having, uh, attained a certain a certain skill level and i've played enough tournament chess and and simply hung around with enough uh really elite players to know that um on any given day um i've i've got i've got a shot against them and uh i think that achieving the IM title would, would be the you know, sort of undisputed proof, right. That I could then sort of present to the, the, the chess enthusiast public is, as like, you know what, maybe, maybe um, my opinions should be taken, uh, you know, somewhat seriously, right. Like to have that sort of credibility. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's also an incredibly hard thing to do, right? Like there have been many stories of, of people who've, who've tried and, and fallen short. And um, uh, so it's, it's you know, I, I don't expect it to be, to be easy, but it, it kind of, uh, it, it, it illustrates that mantra of, um, you know, nothing sort of worth achieving should be easy in the first place, right? Like it's, it's, it's part of that challenge, part of the, the journey that will make it all all worthwhile at the end. Inspiring, Evan. I mean, it's you know, you do as um, I I mentioned in uh, in the email to Patreon subs. You do have the advantage of living in New York City. I mean, that that helps because I know you're out there at the Marshall all the time. You don't have to travel too much to play. But of course, as you say, it's um, it's it's an immense challenge. And as as you alluded to in the dojo interview, you've had a lot of life changes, as probably we all have uh, over the past 10 years since your your rating peak in 2011. So what was when I mean, it's I'm sure it's one of those things where like the seed was planted, you know, it was always in the back of your mind. But when was it go time? When did you decide, like, okay, I am going to do this? Uh, how many years ago? And was there a triggering incident? So um, I'll need to dive a little bit into, into my, my chess history, I think, to give you the most um, fulfilling answer. Um, uh, I was uh, sort of raised um, in a... a uh, chess heavy culture by virtue of having gone to hunter right so um sunil wiramatri who i know is a, a a former guest on on your your show he um he he cultivated you know one of the the top programs in 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 the country if not um you know if not the world um and i was simply along for the ride right i was never tapped as a, a a prodigy or as as someone who was you know gifted with the, with all of this chess potential, um, instead I would sit back and and sort of uh, watch in awe at my peers, you know, uh, achieving astronomical ratings and um, uh, winning national championships. Right, all of that seemed really exciting, but but also completely beyond my reach. But what eventually ended up happening was that all of these these um, superstar uh, teammates of mine would get burned out, right? The pressure became uh, immense, and uh, you know, no ten year old should have to like carry that that responsibility. And and the vast majority of them left tournament chess and never looked back this really kind of opened the door for me in a lot of ways because I was able to sort of continue gradually um, improving and, and gaining confidence in myself um, without uh, being the target of, of all of that, that pressure, right? Because nobody, um, you know, not to oversimplify it, but you know, nobody really believed in me that same, that same kind of way. So there's a lot of like, chip on my shoulder, like underdog mentality that kind of goes into it, um, where um, I certainly think that I uh, 
got good enough, right, to make uh, uh, you know pursuing something like the IM title um, uh, uh, a, a, a realistic goal. But but also I I I think I'm driven by uh, you know you know wanting to kind of go back and and do the like see I told you so you know, <laughs> sort of sort of move where you know like you know maybe had you uh you know found some you know uh something special right in in me at that earlier age you know who who knows maybe I sh- would be shooting for the GM title and not the IM title right but but the the trajectory uh that I took instead you know led me here um I feel like once I you know grew more confident uh that I could um that I could come out on top in competitive chess among my peers uh that sort of naturally translated to to me wanting to to pursue you know that that title um in the world of like adult competitive chess afterwards okay and and in this latest comeback, I mean, we all come and go from chess. Now, again, since you live in New York, you you maybe never completely quit. I don't know. But when did you get serious in this most recent push uh, about your chess? So after, um, after I finished graduate school um, at NYU, uh, uh, I, I started law school. And law school was uh, essentially my uh, the way I announced my retirement from, from chess uh, by default because it's just a huge time commitment, and I wouldn't have been able to to complete it if I had had stayed active. So law school pulled me out of the loop, and then subsequently, you know, taking the bar and 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 practicing as an attorney took me out of, of, of the loop for um, uh, six or seven years, right? I mean, my if you look at my, my game history, I probably played like once a, or twice a year, and that would uh, um, typically be in, in Parsippany, right? So that, that event that everyone kind of considers their like exception to the retirement rule. Yeah, it's like the old timers game. Exactly. and. Um, and it wasn't until I caught wind of Alpha Zero uh, that my uh, decision to to stay away f- from chess um, wasn't um, contested, right? Uh, but seeing some of Alpha Zero's games really kind of inspired me, and uh, you know, having been away from it for so many years. Um, at all, you know, kind of, uh, um, you know, it, it, uh, increases my appetite a little bit too, but, but the, the way that alpha zero played chess, um, was, was absolutely, um, mind blowing to me. And in my, um, desire to learn more about that, um, I kind of had no choice but to like shake the rust off and, and just, and just get to work. Um, I discovered Chessable around that time and created an account there. Um, and, uh, just kind of gradually reemerged, uh, in, in that world, as you explained, uh, having the benefit of living in, in New York city, I don't think can be understated because there is a, uh, a, um, a, a deep um, uh, chess culture and community that that exists here, um, e- you know, even through the pandemic, uh, which was really helpful to have that as, as a resource too. And, and when was so? When was this? So, uh, um, I'd say it was. Uh, my son had probably uh, he probably been over a year old at that point, and. Um, I was uh, more or less still like a new parent and uh, more or less still like a, a, a uh, you know, new attorney. 
um, right, without lots of years of, of experience practicing on, under my belt. Um, and I, I was not, not over the novelty of it, but I felt like the dust had sort of settled in a way. Um, and, uh, it, it like really occurred to me at that point, I guess it was around, uh, 2019, um, late 2019, early 2020, that I really missed chess, that there was like a void in my life that, um, that couldn't be filled, um, uh, without that, uh, unique presence of, uh, of, of playing and of, um, of, of watching games and, uh, and, and reading about it or listening about it. Right. When, when the queen's gambit, uh, rolled around, it was in a, in a way the universe's, uh, message to me, right? Like, Hey, Evan, like your instincts were right. Like chess is, 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 is firmly, uh, uh, on, on the, uh, the, the mind of, of the general public. And, um, you shouldn't, you shouldn't hesitate in trying to, to, to go back and to, you know, pick up, pick up where I left off. Excellent. Yeah. And we're going to talk about what's going on with your actual game and your study methods. But first, Evan, we are introducing a new sponsored segment and it's going to help us talk about your game. And this segment is called the chess dot bomb. So this is a new segment for 2022 on each adult improver episode. Um, we will highlight a membership feature of chess.com and Evan has kindly agreed to cooperate. Although he is a regular chess.com player. In fact, we played each other in uh, entitled Tuesday, which of course we've played training games that we scheduled on top of that. But it was funny when we just randomly ended up getting paired against each other there. Um, so Evan, I understand that you're willing to be our guinea pig and you, you ran the chess.com insights feature but first we should just say it's an it's basically an algorithm that looks at your games at chess.com and gives you sort of um conclusions about things like different little data points some of them are actionable they tell you like they show the specific tactics that you missed and some of them of course can be more whimsical so evan when you ran your chess.com insights what did you discover about your game so a few uh, a few uh, components of the the in, insights feature um, I I I could have guessed before it was generated for me right that I'm uh, more accurate um, in, uh, in 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 more sort of balanced smooth games right and then when when I enter uh, complications and things get messy is when my my accuracy will um, will dip right um, but there were also some some things that were brought to my attention that I, that I didn't appreciate before, uh, in, in terms of, of how accurately I play with certain pieces, um, which I, I found useful and, um, uh, even, you know, how, how well will I play at a certain time of day, right. Versus another time of day. Um, you know, all, all this stuff really matters at the end of the day and, and, and in terms of becoming a better chess player overall. Yeah, for sure. And uh, I don't know about you, Evan, but when I play Titled Tuesday, you know, there's a small increment. Um, you know, I always go over the openings. I take the game seriously. So it wasn't a big surprise to me that I play a bit better in Titled Tuesday than on Tilted Wednesday, Tilted Thursday, Tilted Friday, um, as, I, as I discovered via the chess.com insights. Did you have a uh, similar experience? So if, if, if I can make one suggestion, to the uh, uh, think tank behind all of um, chess.com's uh, uh, creative ideas, it would be to find some way to account for tilt in <laughs> the uh, insight uh, algorithm. Uh, because there's no question that uh, the, the quality of my play uh, will be affected by just how, how tilted I am. Uh, because the the desire to play deliberately questionable moves just to stick it to your opponent, right, is probably going to corrupt the data of your otherwise, like, you know, pure and, and innocent games. Um, so 
some kind of like tilt radar to help you know disaggregate those games from the rest i think would make it far more insightful than it already is excellent so hopefully y'all got that chess.com and uh to wrap up our sponsored feature first of all i want to say i'm happy to work with chess.com obviously longtime user of this up and coming chess site and just wanted to let listeners know that if you do decide to spring for a membership the insights are available with a diamond level membership as well as of course access to their full library but whatever type of membership you were to spring for if you use the link in the show description you would be helping to support perpetual chess which is always appreciated and evan thank you for helping out with the chess.bomb but it's time to bring it forward to your tournament because we talked to FM Doug Eckert. I, I asked him your question. You managed to defeat him in the first round. Um, and, you know, Doug's a strong player, so yes, strong start to the tournament. But then uh, things, unfortunately, didn't didn't go probably as uh, certainly I hoped and probably you hoped as well. So what's the tournament report from the uh, Charlotte Chess Center Holiday Invitational? Yeah, no, I appreciate your, your trying to be diplomatic. <laughs> uh, but, uh, there. yeah, there's no there's no real um sort of delicate way of, of saying that the second half of my tournament um i don't know can i can i swear is this going to be you, you can as long as you don't play it for your kids yeah i mean it was it was felt really shitty right? <laughs> yeah. like um uh almost like numbing in a way uh and and that actually was a little bit of a concern uh, if, you know, if, if after losing like my, my, my third game in a row, I was worried, like, should I be angrier? Like, should I, should I feel like there's more at stake here? Um, uh, like I need to play as if my life depended on it, or is it actually a good thing that I can just, you know, show up the next day and continue to play regardless of the result. And I don't actually know what the answer to that question is, or if there e- is, it, if there's even a good answer to that question, but um, uh, it is, it is safe to say that I, I had two, two very different experiences, right? My first four rounds, I scored two and a half points. And then my, my uh, last five rounds in the second, the second stretch, uh, I, I didn't score any points. And so um, why was that? Uh, I think there are a few factors. One, um, this was the, the, the very first um, closed like round robin type of event I've ever played in. So um, every game for me was a learning experience in that regard. Um, but what, uh, what was most uh, critical moving forward was uh, stuff that really had nothing to do with substantive chess at all, right? It was stamina, it was endurance, it was um, uh, making sure that I got enough sleep, right? It was making sure that I um, was like psychologically um, tuned in. Uh, One of my biggest weaknesses as a chess player is the tendency to um to finalize a result of my current game while i'm still in the game (laughs) and then to kind of hypothesize beyond that right so i'll think all right so after i win this game (laughs) how's that going to affect my standing in the next round meanwhile i'm still playing the game like it's still right in front of me and i'm i've somehow convinced myself that i've already won Right, or that the game's over, and that's uh, a really detrimental. It's detrimental to my to my chess, right? To 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 uh, to to trying to be as present as I can, like in the game, in the moment. I find myself. I, I'm finding that I have to constantly remind myself to like stop daydreaming in a way. To like stop letting that. Uh, that that hypothetical tape uh, play you know play out and just recenter myself and refocus myself and and just commit to trying to find the best move in the position like that I'm given and it really I mean it really took me until sort of the very last round to um, I think to sort of be at peace with that or to like acknowledge that it's it's 
it, it's a it's a conflict that I can resolve, right? That it it, it 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 I don't think that it will permanently derail my my pursuit to become uh, an I am. If anything, I need to really know as much about myself, right, as I can in, in order to to put myself in the best position to do it. Yeah, I saw some of your game I'm, and the one with uh, Dominique Myers really was memorable because it was so, just so all over the place, you know? What, what was amazing about that game was I think it was a really good illustration of how my my personal evaluation bar can be so um, uh, uh, different yeah. from the uh, Silicon uh, version, right? From, from, from what Stockfish thinks and um uh so you mentioned that i've been working with gm uh eugene perlstein and so we we spoke briefly about that uh that specific game um uh i had i had sort of prepped against that you know the 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 one f5 against knight f3 line um but the fact is that um I had usually gotten such good positions against that line in the past that we both agreed that it, it wasn't worth um, investing any anything like beyond that. And so when we reached that position over the board, I think that I was sort of hardwired to give an edge to white, right? Um, like on principle and to like not take his position very seriously. When I think after probably 10 moves, I was worse even though his position looked a little ugly, um, it, it, it took very little for him to, um, to uh, uh, sort of um, reveal like what was really um, uh, powerful in, in, in his whole development scheme. And um, where I thought he would be desperate not to lose, in fact, uh, I should have been relieved that I had, you know, somehow created drawing chances, right? So I was completely off, like, in my, my the way that I was approaching the position. Um, and that's something that I'm going to have to continue to, to improve moving forward. But um, I think it, it's, you can sort of easily use that as a, you know, something to distinguish the, like, pretty good from the great. Is 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 how um, how to handle uh, accepting a more or less equal or balanced position, uh, knowing that any attempt to create chances or to unbalance is only uh, putting your your chances of winning at risk, and can't actually improve. Yeah. So so it sounds like a lot of the points you've highlighted are psychological, at least from this particular tournament. Now, uh, Patreon sub Zachary Haskin had written in to ask uh, of you or Dalton, um, the interview with Doug has already happened, so I can't ask Doug, but we touched on it. Um, and, the, the, and what he's wondering is, are there specific chess things uh, that you feel like you need to do in order to close the gap between you and an international master and how you're approaching that from a training perspective, Evan? Uh, yeah, that's an excellent question. Um, so it's, uh, I, I sort of wish I didn't have to say this, but the reality is, um, you have to have your, your, your opening theory, like really tight, um, uh, to, to be a title player. Uh, there's just like a baseline amount of theory you have to know because that's, that's the expectation, right? Um, uh, your your opponents are going to be very well prepared, and so you just you have to know it. Um, fortunately, there are a lot of tools available, like at our disposal, that even if you're not I am strength, you can still play. You, know, you can still get out of the opening with with good positions. Um, it's what you do once you reach those positions that will um uh you know, that that will pose the the greatest obstacle right so um one approach 
that um, that Eugene uh, has introduced me to, and that uh, has has proven to be really helpful, is to uh, once you reach a position where basically you can um, uh, you can identify the transition from opening to to middle game, you switch sides and you play against the engine, uh, and the object is basically to um, try to beat, right? Try to beat your line, right? Try different plans, uh, see, see what strategies work and what doesn't. But essentially, you're putting the engine in, in your seat, right? Yeah. The engine will, will, then, um, will then guide you through how to respond to all the possible approaches that your opponent could take uh, in, in that, in that given position. So it's not so much like a training game, right? Where you, you're just playing the, the computer to beat it, but it's the only way that you can really effectively ask it a question and get some kind of reasonable answer, um, you know, through just being able to translate the type of moves it evaluates and, and the difference be- between, you know, top and, and maybe second or, or, or third tier moves. So great idea. Shout out to Eugene, of course, friend of the pod. Now the big question, Evan, is are you actually doing it? Because it's all this engine stuff, like, I, like you know, when aim chest is always telling me I'm bad at converting positions, at least yeah. in blitz. And, you know, thank you, aim chest, but I'm still bad. You know, right. As, osmosis, like, you know, snapping my fingers doesn't seem to change it, you know? Yeah, right. It's like, it's like going into a doctor's office and complaining <laughs> that when you when you lift your arm up, it hurts. He goes, oh, okay, so stop lifting your arm up. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, oh, great advice. Um, so uh, am, I, am, I, am I doing it? Yes, but I'm doing it like, I'm sort of doing it uh, to, the, uh, to the best of my ability under like less than ideal circumstances. Right, yeah. Right? Because in order for me to, to really like, maximize the benefit from that i i would basically have to forego like any uh you know any time to like play around with my with my son right yeah, or like any time to like go out with my wife and um or any time to even just like you know read a book or or, or, or the newspaper um and it's it's hard because i want to improve at chess right I even would, you know, like to the extent that like it, it, it is, you know, I, that I would be considered like a professional, but it's just, it's, it's, it's really hard to structure my life the way that a chess professional's life would need to be structured um, because of all these other, you know, really amazing things, right. That, that I'm, uh, you know, that, that, that are a part of, of my, my world and, and who I am. So, uh, I guess that's just, um, I guess that's just something I sort of have to accept that yeah. like, you know, I, it's, I, I, I think Eugene's advice is, is excellent and, um, I'm trying to do the most with it that I can, but at the end of the day, am I doing as much as I need to be doing? Probably not. Yeah. Uh, Obviously, I've grappled with the same questions and come to the same conclusion. You just, you know, life has to come first. You, yeah. you know, you're you're not doing a service to anyone if you, you know, um, m- make your relationships worse with your loved ones <laughs> to to get better at a game. Um, so, how much time are you managing to spend on on your chess? How many hours a week would you say you're able to study? So, um, it it certainly depends, but but more or less. Um, I'm trying to set aside uh, two hours every day. That's good. Two hours every day, good which, is, which yeah. is good, right? And then it's like, so, so how am I actually, um, how am I actually using that that time? Because um, I think one of the 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 easiest traps to fall into is to play like a mindless blitz session for ninety minutes and then cross off. Oh, I played chess for 90 minutes. Right. Right. As if it somehow contributed to my plan to improve as a player. And if anything, it it, it probably would have the opposite effect. Um, so 
it re- it would be uh, in the long term, it would be better for me to spend 15 minutes um, trying to solve like a composed problem uh, like by Divreski than it would for me to um, be engaged with chess in some form or fashion for like three hours. But that was all sort of like arbitrary and random and um, uh, like improvised, right? Like if, if I am playing chess to like fill time or uh, as like an afterthought, like, oh, I have a few minutes, I'll hop on chess.com and play a blitz game. I need to be really, um, uh, really disciplined to not trick myself into thinking that that somehow counts towards, you know, trying to like meet my, my personal quota for study time during the day. Um, but at the same time, and I'm sure you can relate, it's hard to find blocks of completely uninterrupted yeah. time where you, um, where I, I won't risk, uh, getting distracted, right? Like, um, that's like, that's what three-year-olds I think do best is yeah. to, like actually, um, distract you from, from what you're, you're trying to do, but they're just so darn cute that, mm. uh, they'll win every time. Um, the, uh, the other thing that, that I try, you know, aside from just trying to, um, study for two hours a day is to keep playing regularly. Right. So you mentioned before that uh, I, I'm regularly visiting the Marshall Chess Club, which is which is true, um, and that for me uh, exposes like the real um, weaknesses that I that I must work on to improve. Uh, that I simply can't. Um, there's no way of replicating that playing blitz or even rapid online, right? Playing over the board um, in a chess club. Uh, under those conditions, right? Not from the comfort of my my couch or my desk at home, right? But playing like that, that's about as close as you can get to like an objective and, you know, and like Im- impartial, you know, environment, environmental conditions um, where uh, it's uh, it's an even playing field for everybody. Yeah. Uh, Right. Like you don't have to worry about, uh, internet connection, uh, right. Being like, uh, unstable or anything, or it's just, it's, it's you and your opponent. Um, and, and those games, uh, and, and making sure that I review them and annotate them and, and that I do it honestly, I, I will get more out of doing that with a single tournament game than I would out of, you know, doing it with 50, 50 online games. Yeah, I feel the same way. And I did see that you already got back out there after Charlotte and had a good showing. So, you know, the uh, the beat goes on. It <laughs> does. I don't, do you, I mean, were you aware? So I'm playing in an, a Norm event in a week and a half. Oh, the one you did, Levy Rosman. Is, yeah. I mean, probably not his section, but uh, but yeah, he mentioned he's he's going to be chasing the GM title right. again. With um, So it, it is, it, it's it's in the same uh, uh, overall event, but I'm, I'm playing in a different section. Than, than Levy, um, but I, I I feel good about it. I feel encouraged, um, uh, uh, and you know certainly the fact that I'm playing in New York City and not mm-hmm. having to hop on a plane to get anywhere, uh, I think will will prove to to make an enormous difference. Um, and uh, the the benefit of of uh, having my own bed to sleep in it, you know, the night before you know playing my my round. Um, and having my family, yeah, too, uh, I think it will it will pay dividends. Cool. Well, good luck for that. That'll still be forthcoming when this episode comes out. Now, Evan, we gotta wrap things up, but I do have a couple more questions. Number one, um, I have to ask about your wife. It seems like she's a saint. I mean, uh, my wife is pretty supportive. I'm getting to play more than ever, but as I've mentioned in recent pods, like my kids are a little bit older. Your your son is three. Like you're in the trenches. So, what does she say when you tell her you want to spend, uh, you know, Ooh. you want to spend the holiday weekend in Charlotte playing chess? I don't. I don't. I don't think uh, I. I could. You know, in 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 uh, however many lifetimes. 
uh, do enough to repay her for the um, the sacrifices she's made to to help me in wanting to um, achieve my own my own chess chess goals. Um, there may also be uh, a uh, a certain amount of guilt that she carries for encouraging me to go to law school in the first place. <laughs> uh, and, you know, I certainly don't, um, I certainly don't hold her responsible for that, but, um, but she has taken on um, a, a disproportionate amount of childcare responsibilities, right. Especially when I have to fly to Charlotte for a week, right. Yeah. And she's, and she's a, a single parent. Um, she's incredible. Uh, I couldn't do this without her. Um, and I actually think that one of the, you know, so ha having, having, uh, support like that, right. It's, it's different from the support that, uh, someone like, um, a, uh, a, a younger player who also aspires to be an IM or a GM gets from their parents, right? Like that's also crucial, but it's different. Um, and uh, I, I feel truly lucky to have um, a family, right? Uh, my wife and my son, who um, who will accept that uh, I may not be around all the time, uh, but that they still like want me to go for it, and that they still believe in me. And um, yeah, that's uh, that's that's integral to my to my, uh, you know, even, uh, pursuing this at all in, in the first place. For sure. And, and Evan, so you, you alluded to being a sort of another, uh, potentially lapsed lawyer. Are you still practicing law right now or just, just, uh, teaching chess? So I, um, as of, uh, I'll say winter of 2021, I, I had more or less, um, uh, transitioned all of my my clients and my active cases to other attorneys in the firm where I worked, and um, and and made the commitment to um, to to playing and and teaching chess full time. So while I still am uh, a licensed attorney, uh, who you know it's 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 possible that I uh, may not abandon that career all altogether. You know, especially if like an, a chess player you know needed legal help for whatever reason. Um, but as far as, uh, uh, um, career, um, uh, decisions go, uh, I'm, I'm, I wouldn't consider myself, uh, a practicing attorney at this point, And I have, um, really squarely focused on, um, on, on chess. Okay. Well, good luck. And are you taking students? If anyone listening, um, needs, needs some, some pointers. I am. Uh, Excellent. yeah. So, yeah, please uh, reach out uh, if okay. you're looking for for a, a teacher, a coach. Excellent. Yeah, and we'll put that info in the show notes, of course. How to how to uh, track Evan down? He's es Rosenberg on chess.com, among uh, many other ways to reach him. He's on Twitter. But last last question, Evan. Uh, we got to. I I could keep going, but since there's three interviews in this episode, we got to got to wrap things up. But we have a Patreon question from Alex Friedman, the uh, the Walter Cronkite of chess Patreon subs, always asking good questions. Shout out to Alex. Um, and he says, as a chess teacher with a background in education, what have you? found to be the most effective way to reduce blunders and keep a robust robust mental checklist asking for a friend of course um yeah so i will i will say that i am uh um it's it, it has definitely been uh meaningful for me to to take my my background in teaching and like pedagogy and, and teaching methodology and applying that to, to chess instruction, um, to reduce blunders. Um, for one thing, you've got to, you've got to like play enough to actually show that, uh, you're not going to repeat the same mistakes that you did. Right. I, I think there's, there is a, a, a certain fear that, uh, once you've made the mistake that, you don't want to put yourself at risk of making it again by like having to play. Um, and I get that, right. Cause there's a certain vulnerability, uh, that you, um, are like exposing, but it's the only way to do it. Right. So, um, keep, 
grinding, right? If you want to reduce blunders, accept that you may make them, but go out and, and play anyway, right? Because we all make blunders. Um, world champions blunder, right? We saw Magnus blunder against Abdu Sadarov um, in the, the World Rapid. And I was so thrilled because I was like, I can show this to my students. Yeah. Right. As like a perfect example of like everyone makes mistakes. As far as to answer Alex's specific question, though, um, you've got to. Um, you, you owe it to yourself to do like one sort of last blunder check before you commit to your move. Right. So you've done your calculation. You looked at your candidate moves. You think you know what you're going to play. And before you do try to the best of your ability to kind of take a step back or, um, you know, even like to, to try to sort of look at the position from a bird's eye view, try to be as objective as you can and say like, is there anything that I missed, any blind spot that, that, that I, I overlooked? Um, and if you get into the habit of doing that, it'll eventually sort of become automatic. Excellent. Excellent. And of course, Alex, if you haven't already, uh, Evan's coach, GM Eugene Perlstein, did a how-to chess on the topic of avoiding blunders. And ever since that interview, I haven't blundered once. That's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right. So on that note, Evan, this has been amazing. We'll certainly be rooting for you in New York and beyond. And I'm sure we will uh, we will actually see each other at a chess tournament if this, uh, if this um, pandemic ever would be so gracious as to uh to go away i'm um, very much looking forward to that ben excellent well good luck and uh again we'll we'll put your info so people can find it and looking forward to uh to seeing your continued comeback outstanding Perpetual Chess is brought to you in part by ChessFizz.com. I'm happy to report that after their first ad last year, many of you checked out the ChessFizz app and enjoyed the product. In this upcoming interview with FM Dalton Perrine, you'll hear him talk about the importance of calculation and visualization work. Well, ChessFizz can help you with that. They have a unique approach to puzzles that helps you train your visualization. There's also Blindfold Chess, where you can play blindfold against engines of different levels. There's a big opening explorer database. Tons of cool features that you can check out. Most of the features are free and advanced features are available for $3 a month, which can be discounted further if you get an annual subscription. So if you're interested in checking it out, go to the website chessviz with an S dot com. And from there, you'll see download links for a an app on your iPhone or Android. And we are back with our final contestant here in the Master to I Am special episode. Of course, it's not really a competition. And as we've said before, it's more about the uh, journey than the destination. But nonetheless, our third guest, he is a 28-year-old, formerly Florida-based, currently chess digital nomad, chess coach and FIDE master rated, I believe, 2332 USCF, which is right near his rating peak. He is a chessable author. Last year, he published the course Survive and Thrive, How to Blunder Less and Defend Better. We talked about it in a How to Chess episode, which you all should definitely check out. Uh, U.S. champion Sam Shanklin is a big fan of the course. And by the way, he's also been getting lessons from U.S. champion Sam Shanklin, as we will be discussing. I, I really enjoy that course. And he is joining us uh, from St. Louis, recently returned from the South, where he played in the Charlotte Open and has been doing some traveling. So without further ado, let's welcome FM Dalton Perrine to Perpetual Chess. Hey, Dalton, how are you? I'm doing good, Ben. Thanks for thanks for having me on the podcast. Sure, I'm excited. Yeah, and uh, so excited to get a trip report from your Charlotte Open um, and a sort of more general discussion of your training methods. But Dalton, the first question I have asked uh, Doug and Evan and now you is what is what is your why? Um, at 28, I feel like you're already at an age where a lot of probably the people you competed with regularly, say eight to 10 years ago, might drop off of the competitive landscape. A lot of people stay in chess, but they just can't deal with tournaments anymore. But you're still grinding hard, uh, putting in many hours. So what is it that, that motivates uh, this continued pursuit, Dalton? I think at the end of the day, it's really just a love of the game. And I really like competition, generally speaking. Um, I mean, other than chess throughout my life, I've done lots of other competitive things like competitive sports, uh, 
other competitive games, different things like that. Um, so really just always striving to be as good as I can be um, and trying to, you know, see what that is through the uh, training and competition at the end of the day. Yeah, th that's relatable and a good answer. So what sports did you play, Dalton? I played basketball and football. Oh, nice. Um, yeah, the, some of the uh, the American classics. Um, and have there been moments where you've either taken breaks from tournament chess or uh, considered quitting? Or have you just had the fire burning uh, your entire OTB career, you could say? Um, I've never considered quitting. I have taken uh, some extended breaks at various points, um, mainly just due to some life circumstances and stuff like that. I think, for example, the year of 2015 to 2016, I might have played in maybe, you know, one or two tournaments or something like that, if I remember. Um, but yeah, I never thought about quitting. Um, knew pretty much knew that chess was always going to be part of my life. And um just always trying to uh, stick with it. But there have been breaks from time to time. Yeah, and, and you are married, but no children, correct? Yes. Okay, and and again, we talked a little about this previously, but so now you're primarily traveling and playing a lot of chess tournaments and doing your, your coaching online? Yep. And uh, your wife is able to uh, to accommodate this lifestyle? She's, uh, we, we joke that she's my manager. So, uh, she's <laughs> nice. the one that organizes a lot of the traveling. We both like to travel anyways, but, uh, she organizes a lot of the traveling and stuff like that. And, um, we, uh, we, we make it work. Um, she's, if anything, she's the one pushing me to do more chess sometimes. <laughs> yeah. Well, hard. no disrespect to your wife, but, uh, before we recorded, you mentioned it's 12 degrees in St. Louis where you are currently. I've got a question. You're, uh, you're, you're travel managing Dalton. Well, St. Louis is good for chess and, um, it just ends up being kind of this time of the year that, uh, that is just pretty cold for sure. <laughs> Yeah, and of course inexpensive. So someone like Eric Rosen, who during non-pandemic times travels quite a bit, uh, has transitioned to maintaining it as a home base, even if there's an understanding he's not actually going to be there that much. Yeah, the price isn't too bad around the area we're in. Yeah, makes sense. So let's get to the chess, Dalton. So I, I want a tournament report. Maybe we could start with that. So the Charlotte Open, I saw that you basically broke even in in rating. Um, and you mentioned via email that basically you had a few games that if you had converted, it, things could have gone even better. Yeah, I ended up getting four and a half out of nine. Um, a couple of different games, at least three specific ones. Um, I was probably plus four, plus five, according to the computer in various positions. But um whether it was due to just some miscalculations during the game, or maybe uh, I think part of it was definitely some time trouble that I was running into in the later stages. Um, ended up, of those three games, losing one and drawing the other two. So definitely some results could have been a bit better. Um, but overall, definitely some things to learn from in the tournament. And uh, even though it was a pretty average tournament, um, didn't, you know, could have been worse. So uh, it didn't end up, being too bad at the end of the day. Yeah, could have been better, could have been worse. Now, hearing you mention time trouble, I have many times I was lucky enough to interview your coach, GM Sam Shanklin, in the very early days of perpetual chess. And he gave some some advice. I've, as regular listeners have heard me mention my struggles with time trouble many times, although my recent tournaments have been slightly better. But anyway, S Sam gave the, the important advice of just sort of when you know you're going to make a move, you should make a move. You should never spend more than 15 minutes. You know, a lot of sort of the, the time-worn advice that is always uh, easier said than done. Um, is, is time trouble something you regularly struggle with, Dalton, or was this more of a, um, an aberration? Um, it's something I've struggled with in the past for sure. I do think generally speaking, I've gotten a little bit better with it. Um, but this particular tournament um, wasn't, it also wasn't helped by the fact that it was one of the tournaments where you don't get extra time on move 40. So uh, that did kind of make things a little bit trickier. But um, yeah, this one I feel like was just a little different maybe than some of the more recent tournaments where I've done a bit better with the time management. Um, but this one a little bit trickier. Yeah, Peter Giannatos and Grant Own and all our friends down in Charlotte running a tight ship. It was was it game ninety with a thirty second increment? Is that is that right? Yeah. Yep. Yeah. 
I think that's a pretty good. I mean, it wouldn't help me, but I think that's a pretty good time control because, um, you know, as uh, Greg Shahadi and others have said, I do think some sort of guaranteed break is important if you're going to be doing multiple rounds a day. Um, and, you know, with the even at the non-professional level, although you're you're pretty close to it, um, with so much opening theory these days, I think you can shorten the time a little bit. Um, what's what's your opinion on that? I know it's an adjustment, but would you prefer more time or do you think that's a good time control? Uh, when I run into time trouble, I prefer more time. And when there's not a time trouble issue, then it really doesn't make a big difference. So um, I think at the end of the day, yeah, it's definitely enough time. It's more so just that um, I just had to do better with managing it for sure. Yeah, and when your opponent gets in time trouble, you love the time. Con- you love it, the time it, control. It feels pretty good at that point. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, cool. And more generally, Dalton, um, what is your approach to to chess study? How many hours are you putting in a day, and wh- what aspects of your game are you focusing on? Uh, in terms of the amount of time I put in during the day, I mean, at, my full time job is coaching, so it kind of feels like I'm always working on chess for the most part. Um, but in terms of specifically doing things for myself, probably, I don't know, uh, at least a serious three hours at least per day, somewhere in that range. Though it's not usually three straight hours, it's usually broken up a pretty good amount throughout the day just with other things going on. Um, most of what I've been working on recently is um, calculation, um, trying to defend better against opponents who are kind of worse off but they kind of throw the kitchen sink at you so making sure that you can kind of finish games off in that regard which was a little bit different than the tournament that i just played in but um other tournaments in the past have kind of had that trouble a little bit more um and also um really just trying to uh hone the openings that i do play while also not necessarily just the memorization of the openings but making sure that i kind of know the middle game plans the structures that occur from the openings and that kind of stuff, um, just tightening a lot of uh, loosens and stuff like that. Yeah, and last year's I Am to GM special episode, I Am Sean Nagel shared a memorable quote about how hard grandmasters are to bring down. So what you say about sort of the, the work you do against uh, converting against feisty players makes sense since you're approaching uh, the same level. And hearing you describe your general approach, Dalton, is that with guidance from your coach, Sam Shanklin, or is it just from your own assessment of what you need to work on? Or is it more a general, this is what players around my level should be doing to improve? Um, I mean, I think it's pretty much a combination of each of those things to some degree. Sam has recommended some things that I've been working on. Um, Calculation is just generally good, I think, for every level of player to improve at, um, regardless of, you know, the level that I'm at versus lower levels or higher levels. Uh, but it has been some guidance from um, some stuff that maybe Sam has recommended, but also things that I've noticed from maybe other games that he hasn't had the chance to look at that I've uh, decided to work on myself as well. Okay, yeah. And speaking of Sam, we have a question from Patreon subscriber Alex Friedman. Thanks, as always, Alex. And Alex asks, he says, what is the one tip that GM Sam Shanklin gave you that helped you the most? Uh, this was a hard. This is a hard question to kind of, pin down i think at the end of the day one of the things that he's emphasized that we've talked about the most that has benefited the most is um if there's something that looks good to do in the position and maybe your first instinct it is is or your first instinct is that it doesn't work out for some reason maybe this certain move you're thinking about looks looks good but it looks like the opponent has some kind of you know response that would be problematic Uh, a good question to ask is what if i do it anyways So uh, just kind of forcing it through, making the calculation behind it work. And uh, sometimes you can find that what you intended to do or what you wanted to do in the first place, even if it looks like it maybe doesn't work, if you you can a lot of times work around it and and make it work essentially uh, in in a beneficial way. Yeah, Sam strikes me as a strong-willed individual, so somehow that doesn't surprise me too much. And actually, I posted a puzzle on Twitter yesterday. I've been working through uh, step five on the chess steps, and it, it was a it was a puzzle that sort of exemplified that, where you the the classic 
thing where you stop at a moment where the answer is right there. You know, you just weren't creative enough a couple moves into a line, or it could be even more than a couple moves. So yeah, just that sort of uh, diligence of just sort of hammering on something if your intuition is telling you that it that it might be the answer. Um, so you just concluded this uh, this Charlotte tournament. What's your general philosophy, Dalton, for how much you're trying to compete? Um, I try to compete or get to a tournament. Ideally, it would be maybe one a month. Um, at the moment, it's kind of been a little bit more like one every other month or one every six weeks or so. Um, that would allow me to kind of have enough time in between the tournaments to work on things that I need to get better at, uh, while also being a little bit cost efficient at the same time. I probably can't uh, go to a tournament every single weekend or something like that. Um, as much as maybe that would be nice, but, um, yeah, trying to get to one, maybe every six to eight weeks is, uh, it's probably the sweet spot for me. Yeah. The, the money is, you know, it, it hasn't really come up, but obviously it's, um, it's an important consideration. These tournaments can, can really add up. So in terms of, um, budgeting for it, I know you mentioned from a competitive, uh, point of view, you've very rarely lacked motivation but from sort of a budgetary time commitment point of view do you do you ever have doubts about it Dalton? um maybe maybe doubts is a little strong I, I do have maybe some you know times where i'll consider okay maybe i could skip this tournament or maybe i could go to this uh maybe closer tournament or something like that versus one that's maybe a little further away um mainly because you know the, there's a cost associated with traveling of course and uh, also when i am playing in a tournament i'm not able to teach at the same time so that kind of uh eats into the you know the income a little bit at that point um but i kind of just treat it as a uh a necessary cost essentially uh it's it's part of my overall uh, goal is to improve and become a better player and it just kind of comes with the territory of uh of what i'm doing yeah and at your level i'm sure it does make you a better coach as well to be so um to be so deep in the weeds of uh, the chess improvement struggle. So do you know what tournament is next for you, Dalton? <clears throat> uh, I think at the moment, the plan is the, I think it's the Southwest class tournament, which is in Texas, I believe in February. Um, I think that's what it's called. I'd have to actually double check that, uh, but I'm pretty sure that's what it is um, in February. That's, that's the plan for the moment. Um, I haven't actually registered yet, but that's, that's, what is most likely going to happen. Yeah. The, the names of these tournaments often run together for me. It's like classic open, you know, sometimes in certain adjectives, sometimes in certain uh, geographical uh, area. <laughs> it's uh, and for, yeah, to me, it's more often, it's like just another tournament. Although of course, shout out to all the organizers. Um, they are often underappreciated. So we do appreciate uh, that they are running them. Um, and Dalton, you mentioned, uh, that you're also working on your defensive skills, which I know is also the topic of your your chessable course, which, as I mentioned, I genuinely recommend it. I got a chance to check it out before our How to Chess interview. And when I announced our interview to uh, Patreon subs, um, Richard McCormick also checked it out, um, also uh, bought it and um has been enjoying it. So he wrote to ask the following question. He says, hi, Dalton. I'm about halfway through your chessable course, having read about it in Ben's preview notes. I'm really enjoying it and finding it very challenging. Maybe a 60% success rate on level one, 30% so far on level two. I dread to think what level three looks like. Um, do you have any plans to release further courses along these lines? And where would you recommend to go next? Uh, presumably if he means if you're wanting to work on your defensive skills. And he says, thank you for providing an excellent resource on a tricky topic. Yeah, so I do plan on releasing another course. Um, I tend to, at least the reason I made this first course on defensive uh, points to some degree is partly from stuff that I've done with students. I see that a lot of students need to work on their kind of uh, – defensive skills or avoiding blunders and things like that, but also because it's something that I've been working on myself. And I would ideally like to make another course that's on another topic that is something that I also kind of need to work on myself as well, which at the moment is a little bit of the converting advantages. So that's at least my working idea for another, um, another course. Uh, I have to kind of figure out how to 
organize it and things like that. So it's not very far into being planned out just yet. Um, but I do also probably plan on um, maybe making like a part two of the Survive and Thrive down the road if people liked it enough. Um, but in terms of uh, what he could do for kind of the next step after the course, um, I think the biggest thing is really just treating uh, any kind of position that you're in, whether it's, you know, during a game or during a tactic puzzle or something like that, really just trying to practice these uh, questions that the course focuses on. Um, you know, what's the opponent threatening with their most recent move? Is the certain move I'm thinking about playing safe to do or not? Um, you can kind of turn any kind of tactic puzzle into a defensive puzzle if you kind of flip the board uh, and, and think about it from the opponent's standpoint. So you can kind of uh, build upon uh, the course and kind of get more examples in that way as well. Thank you for for that answer, Dalton. Yeah, I have something to add, but first I just wanted to briefly mention that question was actually from James Muir. My apologies on on the mistake. Yeah, and I as I as I mentioned on our How to Chess interview, I definitely think this is an underserved um, motif for people to work on. Um, as is converting advantages, as I've mentioned, my uh, aim chess is always harsh with, with with me in the blitz games when it comes to my own ability to to convert advantages. And in terms of a uh, follow on recommendations, James, the only one I can think of is uh, uh, Eric Rosen a long time ago, and a few other guests have recommended uh, Dvoretsky's Recognizing Your Opponent's Resources. I have to confess, it's yet another book that I have purchased but not read. But it's another possibility. But I think Dalton's Dalton's is no joke. Dal Dalton's course is challenging, but obviously something by Dvoretsky might be even more challenging. So um, do, uh, caveat emptor in, in that sense. Um, so, so Dalton, we had another listener question relating to just generally what you think separates you from the IM level. Now, it seems like you're probably pretty close, um, but nonetheless, obviously, you need to to uh, do, do. You may need norms. I haven't checked in with you about norms, and obviously, to raise your FIDE rating, which I think might be especially challenging during COVID times. Um, so. Uh, first of all, do you have any norms? And second of all, what what do you think is the biggest differentiator between a solid IM and your own game right now? Uh, yeah, so I don't have any norms at the moment. Um, definitely kind of uh, working on that with the upcoming tournaments for sure. I then do have to raise the FIDE rating as well uh, a bit. Um, what I think separates myself from a IM at the moment, um, I mean... The easy kind of cop-out answer is really just kind of everything to some degree, but um, at least in terms of the things that I can kind of pick up on when I'm playing against stronger players, what what seems to be a little bit uh, of trouble that I run into. Um, I do think, again, recently it has been converting advantages. I have had some very nice positions against some IMs and GMs and not been able to finish the games off, so that's definitely something that I'm working on. And also, um, there's been a couple of situations where I felt like my opponents just understood the position better than I have. Um, even if there's no tactics or anything like that going on, they've just kind of uh, known where the best place for the pieces are, like what's the better plan to do in the position, whereas maybe I've struggled a bit more with that in certain situations. Um, so kind of getting a better grip of uh, certain structures or situations in middle games um but at a more at a more advanced level than just something like uh, an isolated queen pawn type scenario more more uh more like certain types of middle games where peace arrangements are maybe not as uh familiar to me or things like that um i'm sure there's plenty of other things as well probably my end games need to be need to get better as well but um those are at least the main things that come to mind at the moment yeah, well, I mean, it must feel good that you're at a peak rating. I mean, it, it suggests you're at least moving in the right direction, right? Yeah, that's that's a good feeling for sure. Yeah, and um, I, one thing I've noticed is uh, Doug and Evan, uh, prior interviews on this podcast, both are seem to be um, really emphasizing these I am norm invitationals. Obviously, uh, Charlotte being very often a host of them, but also um, Evan mentioned he's playing one in New York soon, and I know periodically they happen in St. Louis or Texas. Um, are those a point of emphasis for you, Dalton, or do you feel like you just need to do the training and you're worried, like the, the title itself will, you know, become a bigger point of focus later? Mm. 
Yeah, I, I guess for me, I haven't played any of these uh, I Am Norm Invitationals necessarily. Um, I've definitely thought about it. And I guess for me, I just think that as I improve, it'll the norms will eventually come at some point. Um, I do plan on some point at going to some of these invitationals, uh, but it hasn't necessarily been a huge focus at the moment. Um, I'm I'm just under the under the thinking that as I get better, the the norms will come, and if I need to try to specifically shoot for a norm, I'll go to these invitationals uh, when they when they do pop up. Yeah, that makes sense. And and again, I don't I don't know about the cost of all of them, but I know that Peters are are more expensive than the ones in Charlotte are more expensive than a typical tournament. So I I think it's a you know my humble opinion. I think it's a good approach uh, if. If you can get the chest strength, the the norms will be the easy part. And if you can't get the chest strength, no amount of norm tournaments is going to help. So um, I think it's a good uh, good long view approach. So Dalton, I'm as a chess coach. Um, you know, obviously, you've got a lot of insight in terms of what what you feel you need to do to elevate your own game. Um, but as someone who's working with players so often, what what's your general advice to people of uh, how to spend their chess, their precious chess study time? Uh, so I think the biggest thing is, uh, I, I think I might have mentioned this a little bit in the uh, How to Chess podcast, that I think the, big, the biggest thing for a lot of players is improving their calculation um, and being able to foresee and evaluate uh, positions, you know, at least a couple of moves out and making sure that they're not making mistakes along the way when they're thinking through their move options. Um, but other than that, I think over time, I've gotten a bit of a better appreciation working with a lot of students that it kind of depends on what the student's goals are at the end of the day. Um, if they're really serious about improving, then they're going to have to do certain things that maybe they're not going to enjoy uh, necessarily. They're going to have to work on parts of their game that maybe aren't that fun. They're going to have to kind of put in the work and, and adopt this kind of long-term um, approach. Uh, you may not see immediate gains, but you'll get better in the long term. Uh, but a lot of people also can simply work on what they enjoy uh, if they're just wanting to kind of enjoy the game and get a little bit better. If you like working on end games, you can work on those. If you like working on tactics, you can do those. Um, I think at the end of the day, it's best to do something, um, even if it's not as productive maybe as something else, but as long as you're kind of doing something, it's going to be beneficial versus, you know, if, if you're not doing anything, then it's, you're not really going to improve as much in those kind of situations. Yeah. Good, good advice for sure. And yeah, calculation it's, you know, it's just there for everyone. It's, it's unavoidable. And in your lessons with Sam, obviously he's a busy guy. He's playing these top level tournaments, um, especially during, during non COVID times. Um, and you know, uh, historic, um, adult improver really in terms of, uh, the leap he made from, from, you know, top 100 to top 20 player in the year that he won around the period where he won the U S championship. Um, so I'm just curious, like when you do a lesson with someone like that, how often does his own sort of regimen and experiences, uh, inform the conversation? Does he talk about what he's working on? Does he talk about how he got through a specific level and, and, uh, things along those lines? Yeah. A lot of the times his experiences, uh, mesh into the lessons a pretty good amount. We'll look at some games maybe that he's played where he's faced maybe a certain situation or, or type of scenario that I uh, am working on my own games. Um, he'll kind of give me uh, context for what he's doing in his own training or in, in his own time in between tournaments. Um, give like specific advice of how he handles a certain situation that, um, that, you know, gives a good perspective from a very strong player's point of view. Um, so yeah, a lot of it does uh, tie into, what he's also doing in his own time um, for his own uh, studying, for sure. Okay. And what's your approach to preparation, Dalton, like for a specific opponent or within a tournament? Are you a narrow repertoire guy or a try to surprise guy? Are you uh, like, you know, one opening approach is to just feel like you know your stuff so well that you don't care if people know, but then someone, again, I keep, keep mentioning Eric, his name keeps popping in from prior conversations, but he had mentioned that he more tries to target his opponent's weaknesses uh, in, in one of our interviews. What, what's your general approach in, uh, to 
uh, these questions? So in the past, it was more so a, uh, I, I just play these types of openings and this is what I'm going to play regardless of who I play against. Uh, more so in the past, maybe year and a half to two years or something like that. Um, it's been more about, this is the types of openings that I play, but I know enough variety within them uh, that I can kind of uh, introduce some, uh, some wrinkles to the position that maybe my opponent hasn't seen before, um, especially if they've looked at my games in a database. Uh, maybe they'll have seen I play a particular opening, uh, but I've tried to introduce some new layers to it so that I can uh, still come out with some surprises. Um, but I do tend to uh, try to target my opponent a little bit more, but this is easier said than done depending on who it is. Some players that I might play against also have their own narrow repertoire, so they're a little bit easier to target in that way, whereas other people will play just tons of different openings and it's a little bit harder to actually uh, target them when you don't exactly know what they might play on the first move of the game uh, in that way. Yeah, that makes sense. And uh, Dalton, I have just a couple more questions. So getting back to what you were saying about your own training regimen, working on calculation, working on converting advantages, I, I am curious what specific, how specifically you do those things. Uh, are there specific books you read? Are you practicing against an engine for the conversion? What's like, how, how do you, um, how do you actually practice those or try to grow those skills? Yeah, so for calculation, it's really just about finding good exercises. Um, I think, as I've probably mentioned, I think maybe in the other podcast that I'm part of the Killer Chess Training Academy, which has uh, really good uh, training exercises that are given out each week. Um, so in terms of calculation, that's part of it. But uh, like you said, in terms of converting advantages, I do a lot of uh, playing against the computer from advantageous positions and trying to make sure that I can actually finish those positions off. So... I'll play, let's say, some Blitz game online. Um, and then from that particular game, I'll kind of extract a specific position that either myself or my opponent had a pretty sizable advantage. And then I'll take that position and um, put it into a database that I have for a bunch of other uh, training positions. And then I'll take that position, play it out against the computer uh, maybe a couple of times and make sure that I can uh, you know, finish, finish the computer off uh, since I have such a big advantage that really should be doable. Um, in those situations. That's great. I was joking with Evan Rosenberg in our prior interview because Evan's a, a dad like myself and you know he he highlighted a, a somewhat similar training regimen uh, given to him by his coach GM Perl, Eugene Perlstein but um but I was like Evan do you really do it and uh, he he basically copped to not as much as he should which I feel similarly but hearing you talk about spending 3 hours a day and seeing how serious you are Dalton I have a feeling you you really do do the work when it comes to these calculations I mean these conversion uh practices is that uh is that true that you're really doing it yeah i i'm, I'm doing it so yeah I, I, mean, I, I sorry go ahead i was just gonna say it always feels like maybe it could be more but uh but, but I, i'm doing it yeah it, it does always feel that way and so it sounds like you're using chess base for this is that right you use chess base and then do you you just run stockfish is that against is that your sparring partner in these situations yeah i'll, I'll save all the positions or um exercise or something like that on chess space and then i'll either play it against stockfish on chess space just by, kind of by uh you know pressing the space bar and having the computer give their their move at that point sometimes i'll use um maybe like the chess.com uh computer where you can like uh, play it out against the computer on chess.com or lead chess um but yeah it tends to be kind of just sparring with the computer in those situations Okay. And and Dalton, what about books and videos? Like, are you a book slash video person, one or the other? And if so, could you recommend a few of your favorites? Uh, I'm curious both for yourself, but also for for people at different levels listening. Yeah, I'm, I'm a big book person. I've probably read more books in the past than I do nowadays, especially with just how everything's on the internet uh, nowadays. Um, I'm not so big on videos personally because I feel like it's a little bit easier to kind of uh, sit there and not actively partake in it unless you're specifically pausing videos and thinking about the positions as the as the video or, uh, or video lesson is going on um, but I've I remember when I was younger I always had a, a chess book in my hand I'd be in school and reading a chess book under the table and um, yeah it was I, I was I've always been a big reader for sure time honored uh, tradition <laughs> So, so 
some book recommendations. Yes, um, for sure. So let's see. I'm just looking in my Kindle, which is quite a lot. Um, stuff that I've been working on personally has been a lot of stuff by like Jakob Augard, um with the Grandmaster Preparation Series or Excelling at Chess uh, series. Um, I've read through all the uh, My Great Predecessors by Gary Kasparov, which are really great books, just even for the historical stories and kind of what's going on in the in, in back in those times. Um, in terms of stuff for students, I think, or, or for students or, or, you know, adult improvers, so to speak, um, I think that the, uh, I, I really like, I hope I pronounce his name right, uh, Johan Helston. Helston. Oh, yeah, yeah. Um, I really like his trio of books, uh, Mastering Opening Strategy, Mastering Chess Strategy, and Mastering Endgame Strategy. Um, those are really good, I think, uh, for, well, all three phases of the game. Um, there's, let's see, just looking at other stuff in my list here. Yeah, while, while you do that, I'll just mention, I'll just echo sure. basically all those recommendations. But yeah, Johan Helston's are great books, and they can serve a fairly wide range of chess skills. I would say from 1500 USCF to say 21, 2200 is like the sweet spot, but both above and below that, there's there's stuff to uh to learn from that. And uh, Johan also has done a lot of lectures uh, for U.S. chess school that people can find for free uh, on the Chess Dojo YouTube channel. Um, so be sure to check for those. He's one of the many people I would like to do a long form interview with uh, one of these days. But did you did you find anything else to add, Dalton? Yeah, there's some other uh, like exercise books um, that I think are really good. There's uh, strategic chess, uh, strategic chess exercises by Emmanuel Bricard is the name it looks like. And um, one that I have been doing myself, but also uh, have kind of given to some students uh, to work on would be, I think it's titled Critical Moments. And I think it's by Pata Gaprindashvili. Um who is also known for the book Imagination in Chess, which right, is also yeah. a, really, a really good book. Um, so yeah, those are those are some examples of books that I think are really good. Okay, excellent recommendations. Um, so Dalton, I think we've covered the major topics uh, we wanted, I, at least I wanted to hit. Do you have uh, anything to add before we let you get to your three hours of uh, daily study? Um, nothing specific. I think we've covered it pretty well. Okay, well, we'll be uh, we'll be watching and rooting for you. The course, of course, is called Survive and Thrive, How to Blunder Less and Defend Better. It is uh, if if you, like a lot of us, struggle with defending. And, um, you know, I know that the coaches slash trainers, they never want to put a rating range on something because then if someone's like not in that range, they'll be less inclined to buy it. But Dalton, who would you say is the ideal target audience for that uh, for your course? I think it can be used by anybody, uh, but I do think the ideal target audience is probably the kind of intermediate player, somebody that's probably in the, I don't know, maybe 1300 uh, to maybe 1800 USCF rating range somewhere in there. Um, but I do, but I did structure the course enough so that there's a, there's a warm up chapter, which is good for like beginning level players. Um, the puzzles are typically a little bit easier in that chapter. Then in the other chapters, they go forward. There's the level one problems, which are a little bit easier than the level two problems. And then there's level three problems. So, and then in, there is a final chapter that's very challenging, which is probably more for the 2000 plus or master level players. So I, I do think it covers all rating ranges, but if I had to give a specific range, probably the intermediate type player is going to get the most use out of it. Yeah, sounds right to me based on uh, based on what I saw in it. Although I need to do the whole course, so, um, I really I really do. Okay, well, Dalton, this has been great. We'll definitely be rooting for you, and I hope to uh, hope to run into you at one of these tournaments and uh, meet in person one of these days. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, take care. Thank you, Dalton. All right, thanks a lot, Ben. Thanks to everyone who helps make Perpetual Chess possible. Big shout out to my producer, Matthew Passy. I'd also like to thank the Blue Wire Podcast Network with whom we are proud to be affiliated. Be sure to follow us on social media, Beneficial1 on Twitter, at Perpetual Chess on Instagram, and or you can join the Perpetual Chess Facebook group. You can email me, ben at perpetualchesspod.com. And of course, last but not least, I'd like to give major thanks to the Perpetual Chess Patreon and PayPal supporters, those who choose to join that community based on their level of support support 
can do things like submit questions for guests of the show, have access to live Zoom Q&A lectures with grandmasters who often have appeared on the show, going over chess games, answering questions, stuff like that. And you can even get access to ad-free perpetual chess if that's your preference. So, but most of all, thanks to everyone for listening and we will catch you all on the next episode.